cry to God for the illuminating power of his Holy Spirit so that we may know the actual condition of people who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ and thus that we shall proclaim to them the total salvation that is absolutely necessary for the salvation of totally ruined and lost sinners. In our first broadcast on this subject, we tried to give you in general outline the nature of the teaching of the Word of God on the actual condition of sinful men. Last Lord's Day, in the last part of the broadcast, we suggested that there are two ways uh, wherein the teaching of the Word of God concerning the condition of man can be grossly perverted. And we devoted a part of last Lord's Day's broadcast to a discussion of the first of those ways by which we make the Bible mean more than it actually means. We <clears throat> endeavored to point out the danger of making man's inability to believe the gospel as good news, the t danger there is of making that inability a physical inability. And we found out that man can hear the gospel, and we find that many do actually believe the gospel, but, now this is important, they do not believe it as gospel, as the knowledge of God revealed in Christ, as good news from God. In other words, they accept the fact of the gospel as we preach it. Many unsaved people are as sound as a dollar and as orthodox as they can be, and they can tell you they know how to be saved and that they believe the gospel and all that, and yet they're not saved. What's the matter with them? They have heard, and yet they have not heard. They have accepted, but they have never been conquered by the gracious knowledge of God as revealed in the gospel. They have never been transformed into worshipers and adorers of a holy God. They are still afraid of God and they do not receive the gospel as the knowledge of God, the good news that God means well toward them. Their trouble is heart trouble. I'm saying now that the first time a sinful man actually receives the gospel as gospel, he will then and there on the spot become a Christian. He'll be translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God, dear son, the very instant that he's able to receive the knowledge of God in the gospel as the truth for himself. And so we keep on trying to proclaim the gospel in the hopes that one day a man who has listened with his ears but never believed and received with his heart the good news of the knowledge of God, that he'll be able to do so. Now today I want to take up the second way in which we may pervert the Bible teaching about the actual condition of sinful men. And what I'm to say today is very important for all of you who seek to witness to sinners and make a good confession of the Lord Jesus Christ. The way we can pervert the teaching of the Bible in the second place concerning the actual condition of men is by confusing the degree of man's depravity with the extent of his depravity. If you've been reading these passages of Scripture that I've suggested that you soak your soul in, you've come to the conclusion, I trust, that the Bible actually sets forth in relation to the depraved condition of men, it sets forth the extent of the fall of man in Adam. The term total, the ter total depravity of sinners, does not have reference to the degree of man's depravity, but it does have reference to the extent of man's depravity. Now follow me. As with reference to the extent of man's depravity, let me repeat. Man is depraved as to all of his works, as to all of his ability to save himself. He's depraved in every faculty of his soul, and, and depravity certainly means that. Thus, as to the extent of the condition of men since the fall, the Bible, we believe, teaches that he is utterly, totally lost. But no man is as sinful in degree of sin as he might be. Now, here's where we get confused, and many people rebel against us as we try to teach the t t truth about themselves because we're not clearly defining the difference between the fact that a man, in, in the extent, he's plumb lost, but in the degree of his sin, 
No man is as sinful in degree as he might be. Even the hated Adolf Hitler was not that sinful. The Allies saw to that. Even Satan is not totally sinful in the degree of his sin, for a sovereign God holds a check line upon him. Now let me illustrate. A well of water might be totally bad in the extent of its badness, but at the same time, might not be totally bad in the degree of its badness. As to extent, every time you let down a bucket and bring it up full of water drawn from that well, that water could be pronounced bad and unfit for human consumption. And yet the water might not be as bad in degree of badness as it might be. And that brings us to a vital, much needed teaching of the Word of God today along the line of the degree of the badness of sinful men. We preach that as to the extent they fell so far they are totally lost, but that men are not as to degree as bad as they might be, and the reason for that is the goodness and mercy and restraining grace of God. The teaching, therefore, of the Bible concerning the depravity of men uh, sets forth what I want you to think with me this morning about. The, teach, the Bible sets forth the fact that man is restrained from utter ruin in sin by the common or the restraining grace of a holy God. In the chapter we have before us, in chapter 1 of, verse of the book of Romans, three times, verse 24, 26, and 28, we find the expression, wherefore God also gave them up. Now those expressions do not mean that God in his judgment pushed these people into these awful depths of moral ruin, but it does mean that God in his judgment and his wrath gave them up, turned them over, sentenced them to the strong desires of their own heart. Thus, the Bible is plain that there is a common grace of God which restrains men from the lusts or strong desires of their own hearts. And that is plainly taught in the 24th verse of the first chapter of Romans that we have before us. And so I want, if I have time this morning, to ask and answer two questions. First, what means does the common grace of God use to restrain man in his love of sin? In the book of Romans, you'll find five great means that God uses in grace that he extends to all men and thus restrains them so that in the degree of their sinfulness they do not become as bad as they would if God did not restrain them. And as hurriedly as I can, and yet I want to do justice to this very needed teaching of the Word of God, I want to list these five means as outlined in the book of Romans. They are means that a holy God uses to restrain sinful men in the degree of their sinfulness. And the first of these means that God uses is the knowledge of God. In Romans chapter 1, verse 28, we have that expression. And we are taught here in this passage that natural religion or the common knowledge of God, which man has, every man has it, is not sufficient to save a man, but it is sufficient to do two or three things. It is sufficient to render all men without excuse, Romans 1 and 20. We are taught in this passage of Scripture that man could look up at a star, and if he'd see what's there to be seen, he'd receive some knowledge of God. And if he'd act on that knowledge, it would be a great restraint against him. Now that knowledge that man has by looking at the works of the Creator and the evidences of a world created by him is not sufficient to save a man, but it is sufficient, listen to me, to render all men without excuse. 
Now, yes, something we must never dwell lightly upon. Although we do not have all the answers, we must constantly preach that there is not a man living in God's world today that is, has any excuse that will be accepted by a holy and loving God for the fact that he does not adore God and worship God and seek God and seek the knowledge of him in the gospel. Do you see it? In this matter of the natural knowledge which all men have of God, it is sufficient not only to render men without excuse, but that knowledge is sufficient to make of men seekers after a greater and saving knowledge of Almighty God. Oh, I can look every sinner in the face and say there's one thing I know that you ought to be doing. You ought to be seeking to hear the gospel as gospel, to see, to know the knowledge of God, that he's not a tyrant that you to fear, but he's a loving God that in Christ was reconciling the world to himself. And so I can preach to all men first that God Almighty has done enough for you even in his creation and to reveal himself in his nature and character, that first you are absolutely without excuse, and that second he's done enough that if you act upon it and were a rebel, that you'd become a seeker after a greater and saving knowledge of Almighty God. But the fact of the matter is that apart from the sovereign grace of God, men will not seek God. Now, I've been talking about the common grace of God. He sends the rain on the just as well as the unjust. And he'd do good to all men. But the sovereign grace of God is what's necessary to make a man seek God. He ought to seek God because of what he sees. But he will not apart from the special act of God in seeking him. For instance, God sought Cornelius. And when sovereign grace makes of a heathen like Cornelius, makes him into a seeker, after the saving knowledge of God, as the record is given in Acts 11 and 14, God does something else. He not only makes him a seeker after the saving knowledge of God, but he provides that saving knowledge of himself in the words of the missionary. Just exactly as he did in the instance of the apostle Peter going down to Cornelius and preaching to him the words of life. Here's a man who'd become a seeker after the true knowledge of God. And God Almighty didn't make fun of him. He didn't frustrate him. He sent a man to give him the gospel, the gospel. And so in the third place, not only is the knowledge of God that all men have sufficient to render them without excuse, not only is it sufficient to make them a seeker after the greater and saving knowledge of God. They won't do it, but it's sufficient. But in the third place, the natural religion or man's common knowledge of Almighty God is also sufficient to restrain man in his natural love of sin. And so all men have some knowledge of God, and all men have enough knowledge of God to render them without excuse. And all men have enough knowledge of God to make them a, snatch, a seeker after the truth of God. And all men have enough knowledge of God to restrain them in their natural love of sin. And so sinners have no excuse. They ought to be seeking God, and they ought to live better lives than they do. And we must continually press these truths upon all men. God help us to do it. The second means that God in common grace uses to restrain men in their natural love of sin and the lust and strong desires of their own heart and thus keeps men from being as sinful in degree as they would be apart from this. And everybody ought to thank God for this. This second means is he uses our natural affections. This is taught in Romans chapter 1 verse 31. For instance, the love of mother, the love of father, the love of husband or wife, as the case might be, the love of a child, the love of a friend, the love of country. These are natural affections common to men. And although they are not a redeeming virtues, they won't get a man to heaven. They won't get him saved. Surely they are good. And they are good at the hands of a holy good God who uses them to restrain men in their degree of badness. For instance, this is, this is fundamental. The home is the basis of all this natural affection. 
around the home centers the love of the mother, the love of the father, the love of husband or wife, the love of child, the love of a friend, the love of country. And that's all very closely tied up with the home. And thus the home is the basis of this means that God uses, namely our natural affections, to restrain men. And therefore, when Satan destroys the homes of a country, he is able to remove this great restraint of natural affection from the hearts of men. And I say aloud over this broadcast that all of us have a great service to render, not only to our Lord in the realms of his special sovereign grace, but also in the realms of common grace. We ought by precept and example attempt in every way we can to undergird and strengthen the homes of our land, for they are one of God's means of restraining men in their awful sin. And they are, the home is a gift of God and every preacher and teacher and witness that can say a word or by precept or example help to strengthen the moral fiber of our home life is telling men the truth and is a servant of God and will be blessed of God. While the natural affections will not suffice to take a man to heaven, they are used of Almighty God to restrain men in their sinful lust and strong desires in the bent of their hearts. And thus we thank God for this means of common grace in restraining men. Then there's a third uh, means that's given us in the book of Romans, a means that God in common grace, this grace extends to all mankind, thank God, so that no man or to live a day without thanking God for these blessings, even though he's not saved. This third means of common grace in restraining sinners, I, for want of a better expression, call material blessings. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, you read it. And in Acts chapter 14, verse 17, you read that verse very carefully. And from these I am persuaded that the economic pull of the hope of obtaining and enjoying material blessings is a part of God's restraining grace upon the hearts of men. And I believe that when I consider the following statement. If you do not believe that this is of God and this is one blessing from God that men ought not to despise, well, then you go look at people who are sunk in dire, so sunk in dire poverty as to have no hope of material blessings and see them. Or you go look at those born in such, rich, such riches that all blessings lose their meaning and see what kind of lives they live. Well, oh, how sunk in sin the terribly poor and the terribly rich is. Much of the common grace of our American land, I'm persuaded, is born of the great hope which we have in material things. For instance, the merchant is good to you when you go into his store. Is this the love of Christ? Not necessarily. He simply knows that honesty is the best policy, and he wants to serve you well because it will make him money. He desires to prosper in material things, and because of that desire, he, he, he has an honest business, and he sells merchandise at face value. Now, my friends, there's no virtue in this to redeem the soul, but there certainly is value in it to restrain the natural man in his love of sin. Is that merchant and his hope of gain, of making money, of prospering, uh, is conducive to him dealing honestly and fairly. And that's a boon and a blessing to any land, and we ought to thank God for that. The fourth means that God in common grace uses to restrain men in their love of sin, as given us in the book of Romans, as mentioned in the second chapter of Romans at verse 15. And there we have before us the conscience of men. The moral conscience of man is quite different from the spiritual conscience of the Christian. The moral conscience of man is based on his self-love. The spiritual conscience of the Christian is based on the love of Christ. Now, in common grace, a holy love in God forces the natural man to sit in judgment upon himself. He don't want to, but he does. And when the natural man sees his beloved self in a bad moral light, he is pained and hence restrained in his love of sin. Our common grace forces a sinner 
to project himself into another sinner's shoes. And then that old sinner's pain at the trouble the other fellow's in. Why? Simply because of his great love for others? Oh, no. But because he th hates to think of his beloved self being in such a shape. He'll see a fellow in a ditch and it'll try to affect him. For he'll say, boy, I sure wouldn't want to be there myself. Now, my friends, there's no virtue in such self-love, but there's great value in this use which God in common grace makes of the very principle of life in the natural man, in that that man is thus restrained in his love of sin. And men, if they were not rebels against God, would thank God every day, even though they're not saved. For the conscience that God's given men that makes them even sit in judgment on themselves and sometimes sympathize with somebody else. That's a gift of God. That's a means of God in common grace. And the sinner does not live. That's not under obligation to God for that. But the fifth means that God in common grace uses to restrain sinful men in their natural bent toward the destruction of self is given in the 13th chapter of Romans and the third verse. And here we have the gift of the terror of human government. The Word of God do not, does not tell us which particular type of government is ordained of God. Different types have been ordained at different times and in different circumstances according to the capacities of the people for government. But our text here in Romans 13, verses 1 and 7, I hope you'll read it does teach that government is a power ordained of God as a terror to evildoers and a praise to those who do well. Now, this is a gift of God, and it's for all men. And if men were not heartless, willful, terrible rebels, they would thank God for human government, and they would do what Paul advises us to do. Now, here's a preacher who's talking to you right now who's fearful that the liberal, socialistic concept of government in our day, where somebody does, if the government does everything for us, I'm afraid that that's an effort of men under the machinations of Satan to remove this restraining power ordained of God over the sinful hearts of men. Recently, I was reading in the writings of one of such a mentality and he was setting forth his views in opposition to the judicial theory of crime and punishment. And he held in his writings that crime was not a sin to be punished, but a sickness to be treated. And I've also read somewhere that law is not too difficult a subject until you get out to cases. But my friends, suppose somebody takes your daughter and violates her. Is the government then to take the poor, unfortunate violator and give him a rest cure at some resort-like institution? Or would it not be better that the criminal feel the terror of constituted authority because of his hideous crime? See how soft we're getting in this country? Oh, sin's now not sin, it's a disease. And criminals are not criminals, they're just sick people. And that's spreading throughout this land. And thus, my friends, in these things, natural religion or the knowledge of God, Natural affections, love of home, and so forth. Natural blessings, the hope of making a decent living. The moral conscience and the terror of human government. All these are precious gifts from God. And God in common grace uses them to restrain the natural man in his love of sin. And everything we can say to enforce these five great means of God in common grace, thank God for the opportunity. My time is up this morning. Next Lord's Day, I'm going to ask and answer the question, can these five uh, means that God uses to restrain men, can they be sent away? And I sure hope you'll hear me next Sunday as we try to ring the changes on this needed message. My time's up, and now here are our announcements.